All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome back David Hoffeld. And David is the CEO and Chief Sales Trainer at the Hoffeld Group and the author of The Science of Selling, Sell More with Science, uh, both books, and the, the more recent one is The Sell More with Science. So um, how are you doing today, David? Oh, John, I'm good. Exciting to be with you again. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And there you can see the, the books in the background there. Um, so, um, so uh, David, let's just start with the baseline here. So you wrote The, the Science of Selling, and then, so what prompted you to write the second book, The Sell More with Science? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're always reading scientific journals and a number of disciplines looking for relevant insights that we can apply to selling. And in the science of selling, I really focused on how buying occurs. So how does our buyer's brains form a buying decision? How do we align how we sell with that process? And so I found though so much research on what we as sellers can do from our mindsets, the traits, and even certain behaviors that can help all of us get better. So really in this new book, Sell More with Science, we focus on us as sellers. What can we do to get better faster? What does science say? We can speed up our ability to grow our sales. And so that's what we really focus on in this new book. Excellent. Um, and what I what I noticed with the book and reading the book is um, starting off with one of the most fundamental things and and people and this is where it's interesting because it's obviously everything you do is scientifically based. But you say like how you think just determines the results you produce. Now, some people might say, oh, well, that's all that visualization. That's not scientific. Yeah. What's really fascinating is there is so much science in this area. I was blown away by how certain mindsets have been proven over and over and over and over again. We're talking thousands of scientific studies across numerous disciplines over numerous decades. And these certain mindsets have been shown to really be preemptive of success. In other words, it comes, it sets you up for deeper levels of success. It's the foundation that we build on. And so it's not that all mindsets are equal, but how we mm -hmm. think really does uh, determine the results we produce. And this is also something, as I looked into the research, it is just overwhelming. And it's something I think we all devalue a little bit. It's so easy mm -hmm. to be dismissive of, yeah, our mindsets are important. No one's going to say they're not important, but they're not that important, right? It's more of what we do on a sales call that matters. But what the research shows is, boy, if you don't have the right mindset, it really sabotages what you're going to do on a sales call. It makes it very challenging, sometimes almost impossible to succeed. So these mindsets are absolutely mission critical to our success. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And I, and I think I think at least more people are, are discovering it now. And I think the thing is, it's the good thing about it is, with a little bit of work, you can figure out your own mindset and, and you can adjust it. And obviously, you know, these are things you cover in, in the book. Um, the other thing that was really interesting to me is is when you discovered the, the number one trait that you need to succeed. And I just thought that that was so interesting because, you know, people would normally say, oh, it's it's big personality or it's it's, um, you know, it's gregarious or, or whatever it is, but it, but it's not. It's a very fundamental and a very simple, simple, but not easy one. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. So what the trait now, uh, a tremendous amount of research also shows that matters uh, a great deal. We devote a whole chapter to it is the trait mm -hmm. of grit. So grit is sticking with the goal, even when it gets challenging, even when there are obstacles that come up. And what grit has been shown in numerous studies to predict is sales retention and sales performance. In other words, mm -hmm. grittier salespeople are more likely to stay in the profession and stick with the job, and they're more likely to become top performers. But as you mentioned, the exciting thing about all this science is it's very prescriptive. It tells us which mindsets or what traits or which behaviors matter the most, and then how do we embrace it? So it's not only does grit matter, but there's specific things you and I can do to grow our grit and become more gritty. And when we do, we set ourselves up for more success. And the exciting thing about grit is it's bigger than just selling. 
when you are gritty, you're gritty and you can apply that to every area of your life, regardless of the goal. It sets you up for more of the success you desire in your personal and your professional life. Yeah, and, and goodness knows in the world we live in today, uh, grittiness is probably more more important than it ever was almost. Uh, so you say that you, this is something that you can develop because maybe a lot of people would say, oh, you know, David's a really gritty guy. He always does it, but that's not really me. I'm more of a whatever. But so how do you how do you actually develop that grittiness? Because you know, we don't want to give people get out of jail free cards where they just go, Ooh, that's just not me. <laughs> right. And that's the, that's what the science shows us. It's really empowering because it says, you know, all of us can grow in our levels of grit, whether you say, hey, I'm already pretty gritty or, you know, I can improve in this area. Even small improvements, regardless of where you are on that spectrum, can have some noticeable uh, results in your life. So a couple of real simple things real quickly that you can do. Number one is that when you're pursuing a goal, ask yourself, why does this goal matter? and really start to qualify your goals. Here's why that, that matters, the research says, is that when you encounter an obstacle or things get challenging, and they will anytime mm -hmm. you're pursuing a meaningful goal, having a strong why, why this really matters to me, that's gonna give you that extra motivation the data shows to push through that obstacle or overcome that challenge. Another thing that I found is really helpful as well, the research shows, and I've embraced this in my own life, Two is this mindset of the price for success is paid up front. In other words, to achieve the success that we desire, there's a price for that. And so realizing that it's paid up front, it's paid and it's the price of entry to go into that. So recognizing when you try to pursue a meaningful goal, expect it to be challenging. Of course, it's going to be and realize you have to pay the price for that success and that can make a big difference. And then the final thing I, I found that also helps that I'll share real quickly is do a thought exercise. When you're pursuing a goal and it gets challenging, think about, imagine years from now, what it will mm -hmm. be like if you were to persist and achieve that goal. And so oftentimes when you do this little exercise, it helps you realize, okay, I'm going to regret it if I don't keep going, just stepping outside for a moment and doing that little thought exercise and not settling for the easy way out, because the easy way out, though it feels good in the moment, it doesn't feel good long term and it produces that regret. But little things like that you can do that, even though they're simple, have been scientifically proven to radically improve your grittiness and often make the difference between quitting and persisting forward. And as you know, John, the difference often between achieving a meaningful goal and not is in those moments. Do I keep going mm -hmm. or do I shrink back? And the ability to display grit, even when it's challenging, is a hallmark of top performers. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I totally agree. And, and there's so many there are so many examples of, of this. Um, one of the things, though, that uh, is really interesting, it's like, uh, oh, I always come back to Chuck Norris, right? Good old Chuck. And, a, and Chuck Norris does a lot of work with underprivileged kids and all that. Uh, and what he says to them is when the kid is when a kid is about to quit. Right. He says to them, what would you do if you discovered that this was the last obstacle between you and success? Mm. Right. And you quit and you quit just before it. Yeah. And and that way that changes the mindset. You go, oh, well, what if this is the last obstacle? And then, you know, the next one, the next one, whatever. But it's certainly a way of introducing, you know, number one, the fear of quitting, overcoming the, the fear of going on, if you like. Yeah, well, that's a great that's a great uh, that's a great mindset to embrace. And kind of those that getting back to what we talked about a little earlier, mm -hmm. how the way we think determines the results we produce. And it's really having some of those strategies where when things get challenging, and again, they will, you want to go mm -hmm. in with these strategies already thought through so that when you hit that obstacle, when you don't feel like pursuing your goal, even though you know you should, you can default to some of these strategies. Because if you're just reactive, oftentimes that's when people quit and then they regret it later on and you're, you're spot on. Oftentimes when you're in that moment, even if you don't feel like doing what you know you should do, when you do it afterwards, you're glad, right? All of us yeah. uh, can relate to times in our lives when we've done that. We haven't felt like going to the workout or making that extra sales <laughs> call. 
And we do it anyway. And afterwards we say, you know what? I'm glad I did that even in the moment. I didn't feel like it, but it moved me closer to what I want my life to be like in the future. And that's what it's all about. And that's the power really of grit. It is absolutely transformative. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, and I totally can relate to that. You know, there are times when I don't feel like going to, I do martial arts and there's times when I don't feel like going to, to class in the evening. I'm tired and I drag myself up there. And after I come home, ah, so glad I went. Uh, and I, and I think that's the, you know, that, that translates to, to a lot of other things. Um, and, and this is one other, just one other, um, anecdote or, or whatever is that I think people always think that it's the most talented people who always succeed. And that's not actually the truth. It's, it's, it's the people. Yes, you have to have some talent, but it's the people who stick with things. And, and you only have to look at some of the biggest actors in Hollywood. When you read their backstories, you'll find like Mark Ruffalo, for instance, I think he had done 500 auditions, never got anything was, and was ready to quit. And his mother forced him to, to just keep going and eventually like soon after that he he got something but it, it's it's the sticking at it and as you just said the grittiness and so for anybody out there who thinks like well you know i may not be the greatest at this and you go but if you're the greatest at sticking with things i guarantee you you're going to be successful and it's exactly right yeah and you got to think of we all experience failure in fact the most successful people experience more mm -hmm. failure the difference is they don't stop so failure isn't fatal Failure is feedback. And when you don't take it personal, but you say, what can I learn from this? How can I adapt? How can I continue on? When you have that growth mindset where I'm always trying to get better through every situation, good or bad, I want to learn from it. When you have that mindset of a learner, then you don't look at failure as a pronouncement against you personally. You look at it like, okay, I want to learn from this. I want to grow from it. And that mindset, again, that sets you up for such success. And I, I agree a hundred percent. That's what the research shows as well. The most successful people, the top performers in selling or really anything else are not usually the most talented. They don't have the most potential early on. They mm -hmm. just keep learning. They keep growing and they have that grit and that gives them an unfair advantage, even when competing against others who are more talented, but who drop out a little bit earlier, who don't mm -hmm. aren't able to stick with it. And boy, it makes such a difference. So if you're not the most talented person in the room, uh, welcome to the club. That's most of us who achieve anything. But the key is, do you have a growth mindset? Do you have grit? If so, over long term, you're going to be just fine. And that's what this is. You want to think of it, too, as not just a short term endeavor, right? In the next few months, you know, it's, you're paying that price for that success. But over the long term, those with grit, those with the growth mindset, they win and they win big. Yeah, absolutely. Half the battle is showing up in the first place. And so um, one of the things I just wanted to touch on uh, that you that you cover in the book is about how you can, um, you know, help potential clients form buying decisions. And the reason I, I bring this one up particularly is I would say certainly over the pandemic and now we have recessionary um, situation that it's it, that it's not easy right now. Obviously, like selling is not that not that easy right now. Yeah. And it's very, very but it's also very easy for buyers to either to make no decision right now to sort of get very, very conservative. And this is always what what happens. And I think this is this is still a hangover, even from the financial crisis, where the the making a no decision is always in the always in the picture. So how do you how do you overcome that when you're going to have such resi maybe you're going to have a lot of nervousness around pulling the trigger on anything? Yeah, I think you're spot on. That's what we're seeing today. And this has always been a factor, but I agree it's amplified mm -hmm. right now because a no decision seems safer because they already yeah. are not making that decision. So it's that status quo. They just embrace that. I think this is why the way you sell matters so much and really aligning how you sell with how people buy. In other words, we need to make it easier. We need to reduce the friction in forming a buying decision because that's what all the survey data from the last couple of years has really shown. When you survey buyers, they say it's hard right now to make a decision. A, there's so much information in the marketplace, what matters, what doesn't. And right now, the risk tolerance is very low because, because of all the things going on worldwide in the economies around the world and the fears that are there too. So now we need to A, communicate value very clearly so that our buyers are perceiving the value we're presenting and really focusing on how we sell. What I'm seeing right now is there is a tremendous opportunity 
when you focus on aligning how you sell with how people buy? In other words, are you guiding them through that buying process with intentionality? If you do mm -hmm. that, it will set you apart. Because right now, if you're not helping people make a buying decision, to your point, John, most likely they won't. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I and I think that is, and that's not just walking through your your sales process. That's really, as you said, that's really been intentional about everything you do and every communication you have. And I think the other thing is, is just that empathy part is, is recognizing that this may be a very, very big decision for the other person or persons if it's a buying committee. Like I always say, oh, I mean, I go over to Best Buy later on and I buy the latest, greatest TV. I come home, what's the worst gonna happen to me? My wife's gonna go mental and say like, we needed something else. So B to C, whatever. but in B to B, it can be your decision, the buying decisions you make can be career enhancing, they can be career limiting, all of this. And I think sometimes as sellers, we don't always take into account the amount of pressure and not just company pressure, but personal pressure that's on buyers. Uh, absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I think this is mission critical for us to really understand, to your point, the priorities of the buyers. And if you have a buying unit, they're going to have different perspectives, different priorities. Some things will matter more than others so that you're understanding what they're focused on and speaking to those specific things. So you can put their mind at ease, identify where they are in that buying process, that perspective taking. So often, to your point, we as sellers get focused on us and we want to talk about how great our solution is and how it can help them. And we it's so seller centric. We want to really focus on the buyer. And so one good way I always recommend is look at your sales process right now. How much of it is about the buyer? How much is it about you? Even if you're presenting about your solution, is it just about your solution or are you bringing the buyer in? In other words, if they can't see themselves or the relevancy to them, in what you're saying, why are you saying it? Because no one cares. People care about them. So understanding their priorities and speaking specifically to it is mission critical right now because you're exactly right. People are nervous about, the, about making buying decisions. But if you address their concerns, if you're proactive in that and you're very intentional about understanding and then addressing and putting them at ease, that gives you a tremendous competitive advantage. And that's what I'm seeing right now in the marketplace with so much product and service parity. And even in um, uh, the parts of, of, of industries where that's not the case, how you sell seems to matter now more than ever before. It's always been important today. It's mission critical. Yeah, no, I I I, to I totally agree because there are so many um, variables at play, as we said. You know, there's all the fear factor. This is what's going on in the economy. There's the perception of commoditization that people have. Yes. So, yes. yeah, um, the you know, obviously we have a SaaS CRM. There's also the perception that SaaS products you can swap them in and out easily and all of that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you have to cover in order to to get your your buyer kind of focused. Um, and and help them get over these perceptions and, and and you know and as we know perceptions reality so that's the job of us is to convince you that no they aren't all it isn't a commodity and the best way you can do that is how you approach the selling process exactly that's one of the things we talk about in my new book sell more with science is a reframing process that we took about three and a half years to develop looking at a lot of research and testing it out on once I understand. Uh, someone's perspective, how do I help them see their their situation or mm -hmm. my solution in a new, more mutually beneficial way? Because we all have worked with potential clients who desperately, desperately need what we offer, but they're hung up on something and they're looking at it in a way that's not beneficial for them. And so right. how do we nudge them free from that? And that's what reframing is. And we kind of give a model in the book on how to do that, but it's a mission critical skill because people often get stuck in a perspective or a frame and that's how they're viewing their situation and if we don't get them unstuck they lose and so do we and so that's part of our job as salespeople is to help them see things in a new more mutually beneficial more accurate perspective and that's the power of selling that's why it's such a beautiful profession in that we not only change lives we change organizations it's tremendous mm -hmm. good when it's done well and boy right now it matters a lot because a lot of people need what you are selling, but if you're not selling it effectively, 
Well, they're missing out and you're doing them a disservice. So I think now is the time for all of us to reevaluate how we're selling and how can we get a little bit better? Because right now, a little bit can make a big difference in your results. Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. And and given the fact that um, you know my my son started in college in 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 uh, September, and let's face it, a lot of people who come out of college default into sales jobs, right? So there are lots and lots of people, and there's you know there's I can't remember what the stats for how many salespeople there are in the U.S. and you know extrapolated for globally. Um, but this is a this is a job that's been so overlooked in many ways that you know books like yourselves and the trainings and stuff that you do it's so it's so critical that people if you're going to be in this job because as I said a lot of people default into it if you're going to be in this job you might as well be the best at it you can. Yeah, and that's the great thing about selling is uh, unlike many other professions, you really get to determine your income. You can really uh, yeah. determine your career trajectory as well. So one thing I always recommend to everyone, regardless of how long they've been in selling, whether they're young or not so young, uh, a seasoned veteran or someone just starting out is never be cheap with you. Never underinvest in yourself, because when you invest in your own skills, you always have that like that, that that that's bigger than any job. That's you. Mm -hmm. And selling is life. I mean, what selling is, is we're influencing people at a professional level. Um, influence is guiding people and taking what we say seriously and being willing to act on it. You are constantly influencing people in your personal and professional life. Yes. Wouldn't it be nice to be good at that? Wouldn't that open all kind of doors for you in every area of your life? So I always recommend, and this is something I did when I first got into selling, I was very liberal. Even when I didn't have a lot of money, I invested a tremendous amount and the ROI on that investment has been just astronomical. I mean, it was one of the mm -hmm. best decisions I made as a young man. And so I would encourage anyone. There's a lot of places you can cut expenses and be cheap on. You shouldn't be one of them, your skills, because that's something you're going to benefit from your entire career and with selling your entire life. Yeah, I, no, I, I I totally agree with you. And I, and I often say to people, it's, you know, take a look at how much money do you invest in your hobbies, right? Because I guarantee you, you do. Right. And maybe, you know, say you're somebody who plays golf, yeah, you probably take golf lessons occasionally or whatever. What do you do about the thing that puts bread on your table? Do you mm -hmm. ever invest any yes. any money or, or time in that? So yeah, I I totally I, I totally agree with you. And the other part is, and don't wait around for your company to do it because it's great if they do, but don't wait around for somebody else to do it. Do it yourself. I, you're exactly right. I mean, if I would have waited for the companies I've worked for in the past when I first started out to supply the training, we wouldn't be talking. No doubt in my mind, zero <laughs> zero chance uh, because they didn't. And so yeah. I took it on myself. And that's one thing I would challenge people with is you want to push yourself more than your sales manager does. If you need a sales manager to push you to grow, then you want to reevaluate some things. So you want to push yourself much more because it will make a huge difference in your career. And to get to the top of any profession, including a skill based profession like selling, you got to get the best training you can. And so investing in yourself is always the best investment you can make. It's great if you can invest in real estate or stocks or sure. cryptocurrency, more <laughs> power to you. But what matters even more than that is investing in yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, David, this has been fantastic. All of David's information is going to be below this video. Um, and I really would recommend go check out David's book. Check out uh, Selma with Science, The Mindsets, Traits and Behaviors That Create Sales Success. Um, you might even find a recommendation from me in there. So I'm, I'm with all disclosure, I, I highly recommend it. The work that David and his group do, as he said, it's all based in research. It's all based in science. So this isn't not knocking them. This isn't an opinion based or, you know, sales book or one based on here's how I did it. Here's how you should do it. It's all based in, in science. So before we go, David, uh, I want to tell people quickly a little bit more about you and what you do. Yes, I'm CEO and chief sales trainer at Huffeld Group. And you can learn more about us at Huffeld, H-O-F-F-E-L-D, group.com. There's a lot of resources on our website. You can kind of see what science-based selling is all about. There's no cost uh, to those resources, podcasts, uh, blogs, articles, white papers, videos. You can check that all out. And then, of course, as John mentioned, check out the book Sell More with Science and The Science of Selling. They're available anywhere fine books are sold. Yeah, listen, fantastic, David. Great as always catching up with you. Um, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon.